um, I was I was going to finish up the Lorenz system, and then say something about including the unstable directions into the center manifold calculation, and go over an example of that uh, briefly uh, with the Hamiltonian system, and then uh, something about center manifolds for PDEs, which I'm I'm no expert in. Uh, but I will say some things about it. And then maybe we'll get to center manifolds for maps. So I want to first do, you know, this has been a segment on center manifolds for ODEs. Then we'll do a center manifolds for, for maps. A lot of it's going to be very similar, so it'll be, that'll be more brief. And then we'll get on to uh, normal forms for ODEs and then normal forms for maps and then bifurcation theory, ODEs, bifurcations for maps. So that's the plan for the next uh, few weeks. So let's finish up this Lorenz system. Um, are there any questions? No, okay. So this is just, I copied and pasted from last time. This is the part where we put the Lorenz system into the proper form. So the U variable is uh, related to the center directions, and then the V and W are related to the stable directions. So this is a case where, at least at um, for um, this situation, we have a one-dimensional center manifold, but it depends on parameters. Um, and we've decided that uh, sigma and beta were kind of fixed constants, so those aren't parameters technically. We kept rho bar as a parameter. So then we, when we consider rho bar fixed, the center manifold in phase space is just 1D, and we'll approximate it, uh, we approximated it up to second order in rho and U. So that's what these terms are here, the A, um, and B coefficients. And then this thing that says third order, this is third order in U and rho bar because we've kind of added rho bar on as a, uh, a variable. So there, there does exist a center manifold. Um, and I'll note that in the U rho bar space, this is a 2D center manifold. But for each value of rho bar, it's just a 1D center manifold, and it's a parameterized curve, right? Um, and it's a parameterized curve that has to be tangent to the U direction at the origin. Uh, so that's what we get. And then from the tangency conditions, we could figure out what these A and B coefficients are. So we get them to, uh, we're figuring out what this parameterized curve is to leading order. So there's our V and W written as a functions H1 of U and rho bar and H2, it's a function of U and rho bar. Um, so now the next step would be to figure out what is the, what's the dynamics along the center manifold. So let's try that, um, okay. Right, we want to be able to put arrows on this orange curve. So we're going to find the dynamics that is the vector field along the center manifold. That's what this orange thing is. Center manifold of the origin. So then we use the usual approach um, of Remember, in general, we wrote it this way. It was U dot equals a matrix, a C by C matrix A of U plus F of U and then H of U. Now, in this case, A is just zero and the F is a function of U and um, V and W, so we'll just explicitly put that in here. 
and what was that ODE? So if you remember, um, this is one over one plus sigma, sigma rho bar um, times u plus sigma h1 as a function of u and rho bar. So I have enough parentheses there. It's always hard to know. Uh, I think this, I'll just make this a square bracket. Okay. And then plus sigma h2 of u plus sigma, uh, this is, sorry, h2 as a function of u and rho bar times u plus sigma h1 as a function of u and rho bar. So I have enough parentheses there. Okay, so then just plug in what we have up here for what h1 is and h2 to leading order um, and work it all out. Um, I don't know if you want me to bore you with the details or not. Plug everything in and what you'll get is, uh, um, sigma one plus sigma u rho bar minus one over beta u squared plus, and now just to keep track, anything that's second order in the parameter rho bar is gone. And then I'll also include that anything that's fourth order, and this is fourth order with respect to um, u and rho bar mixed together. Those are also left out. So the vector field along the center manifold is this u um, rho bar minus u squared. Uh, I think this should be a u cubed over here or something like that. Yes, this is a u cubed up here. Um, we get that. All right. Plus higher order terms. And then just reminding ourselves that the parameter doesn't vary. So then that's it. That's, that's our ODE along the center manifold. And from this, uh, we can plot a, uh, a bifurcation diagram. And in some sense, we've got the two axes of the bifurcation diagram here. We already have the parameter, rho bar, and then the um, kind of the direction along the center manifold. So we are we could literally just plot this vector field in u and rho bar space, and that's going to be the same as the bifurcation diagram. vector field. And of course, there's no vector, there's no component pointing in the parameter direction. And then here is u. And this is giving, right, this gives location of equilibria where there are zeros. So here um, for, for rho bar less than zero, the, the origin is stable. So the vectors are pointing towards the origin. And then when rho bar is greater than zero, we've got a bifurcation happening. So I'll do this as a dashed line. 
the origin becomes unstable. So you could figure that out just by you know, plotting u dot versus u. And there is a pair of stable points that show up. So if we were to plot the vector field, this is what we would, this is what we would get. So we get two new solutions. So this is uh, what u equals square root theta rho bar u equals negative square root theta rho bar. Um, I think in the diagram we had before, this this branch up here was labeled p plus, and down here was labeled p minus, and the origin just goes unstable. So if we were to look at that, you know, center manifold for some value of rho bar greater than zero, because remember beta is greater than zero, so we've got um, Maybe I'll make the origin like that. So along the center manifold, the vector field looks like that. We've got a stable, sorry, a stable, the positive and a negative branch of this pitchfork bifurcation. All right, and if you remember, let me look at the, um, the, that diagram from last time. This is the diagram from one of the papers that I posted by Eusebius Dodell and others. Um, here it is. Yeah, so they plotted just rho here on the bottom. We did rho bar, so rho bar equal one is this point P that they've got labeled on the left, and then um, that's the main bifurcation that we just looked at. Um, so we've got the P plus branch, the P minus, you know, the origin has gone unstable. Um, the P minus and the P plus become kind of the centers of that, the two parts of the attractor where things are swirling around. Um, but that's due to later bifurcations that occur. But we just looked at kind of this left-hand side. And what else is there to say about this? Um, we we were we were basically looking at the center manifold of the case where rho bar equals zero. So let, let me make a note. At rho bar equals zero, the origin in phase space is a non-hyperbolic. Uh, equilibrium point. But we have the center manifold for a uh, an entire neighborhood neighborhood of the origin. in the u real bar space. Um, this is again, another example that shows the connection between center manifold theory and bifurcation theory, right? The, the center manifold was where we have new equilibria showing up. Um, also, just in case you were wondering some of these higher order terms up here that we've ignored, like this part that's second order in rho, it's not going to change this picture of the pitchfork bifurcation. Maybe it'll lead to wiggles, but it won't, it won't uh, qualitatively change this pitchfork bifurcation. And same with these other higher order terms, they're not going to change it. All right, so, so that's it for the, um, world famous Lorenz system. Um, there's other bifurcations that occur and you could read about them like hop bifurcations.
but what I wanted to say something about now is just including unstable directions. So what do we mean here? And this is Wiggins section 18.3. So we are going to now write our system in a form where X, Y, and Z, we've got uh, X like before is C dimensional, Y like before is S dimensional, and now we've included unstable directions. So Z is U, U dimensional. So we need to, we may need to do a transformation, but we'll be putting our system into a form where it looks like this. Um, AX, F is the nonlinear terms as a function of X, Y, and Z. And A um, is a C by C matrix of um, zero, real part eigenvalues. Y, as you could guess, is going to be equal to BY plus G, X, Y, Z. B is um, an S by S matrix of negative real part eigenvalues. And then Z, the new one, um, we've got a C matrix. And we're running out of symbols, let's use H, X, Y, Z. C is a U by U matrix of positive real part eigenvalues. So we can do that. And then there's still a, there's a center manifold It could still be computed using Taylor series. So um, what would we write? Uh, sorry, not e V, but Y equals H1 X and Z is H2 of X. And then you would do Taylor series approximations for H1 and H2, starting with second order terms. Um, and then you could compute the vector field restricted to the center manifold. And everything carries over as before. This isn't usually, we don't usually introduce the unstable directions first because uh, one of the main motivations for center manifold theory uh, originally was just to find out the stability of the origin. So if you already have an unstable uh, part, so positive real part to the eigenvalues, then you would already know that it's unstable. But there could be cases where you do want to know, uh, compute the center manifold. And it's, it's unavoidable if you have a uh, canonical Hamiltonian system. So this situation is um, I'll just say common. the study of canonical Hamiltonian systems. Because um, U all e always equals S, the number of stable directions equals the number of unstable directions. It's balanced by the number of unstable directions to lead to uh, conservation of the phase flow. So 
and you still have that the dimension of the phase space is u plus s plus c. Okay, so c c has to be even because n is even. If we're studying a canonical Hamiltonian system, n is even, so c is even, and u always equals s. So let me give an example that I'm familiar with. Um, the two degree of freedom restricted three body problem. This is used often to, um, it's a, the next model beyond just Keplerian motion of one small mass around a large mass. It's like now you've got a small mass in the field of two masses where the two masses are on a circular orbit about one another and you want to know what does the third mass do. There's these famous equilibrium points. Um, I could direct you to other literature if you want to know more, more about it. But uh, we're just looking at the, the dynamics near one of these equilibrium points. So to lowest order, it is linear. Um, so let's say something about what this is. It's a two degree of freedom. This is the planar circular restricted three body problem. So this could be uh, the equilibrium points we're talking about. There's five equilibrium points, two are typically stable, but the three that are always unstable, L1, L2, and L3, uh, and what about it? Well, you could write the dynamics in the original variables. So I guess I should, before I, I write that, So we are looking at the dynamics about an equilibrium point. So we've translated the equilibrium point to the origin. In which case, We've got X and Y, but then we also have, because it's a canonical Hamiltonian system, we've got the momentum conjugate to X and the momentum conjugate to Y. So our ODE, at least the linear part, um, looks like this. Zero, zero. Anything that looks like a zero is a zero. There's no random sixes. Okay. Uh, there we go. And then I'll just say, you know, there's higher order. It's nonlinear terms. So second order and higher terms. This we will, I'm just gonna call this matrix A, but of course um, it's not the same as the A up above. Um, you could view this, you could view this system as coming from a Hamiltonian that is about the equilibrium point. So a Hamiltonian function, right? This is, Hamiltonian systems are an example of a, an ODE with special structure, like also gradient systems, these other kinds of systems. Um, and so this, the Hamiltonian function is one of these special structures. So we would write it as the Hamiltonian written about the equilibrium point has a, a term that's quadratic in its variables, x, y, p, x, p, y. There's terms that are purely cubic. In some sense, this is a Taylor series expansion. And lowest order, there's, it's quadratic. 
plus H4 and so on. Um, H2, what is H2? Well, H2 can be written as, if we were to write this, uh, sorry, not that one. If we were to write the vector of the phase space as just Z, then H2 can be written as, and Z is a column vector, then we could write H2 as one half Z transpose J transpose A Z, where, what is J? J is the canonical um, symplectic matrix for this case. So it's zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, uh, negative one, zero, zero, negative one, and everything else is zeros. Okay, so it's H2 uh, taking the canonical Hamilton's equations of H2 that gives you the linear part up here. Um, I, I have some like fixed constants. They're actually variables, so you could do bifurcation analysis, but there's an A and a B, and the only thing you need to know right now is they're both positive. Um, H2, if you, if you actually worked this out, here's what you would get. Uh, Px plus y squared plus Px minus, no, that's, I think it's Py minus x, Py minus x squared minus, oops, minus ax squared plus Py squared. So that's what h2 is. All right. Um, now, if we if we study this using the usual approach, we would want to get the eigenvalues of A, and the eigenvalues of A because it is a Hamiltonian system, um, it's there's some structure to the eigenvalues. So if you were to compute the eigenvalues, and we'll also compute the eigenvectors generalized eigenvectors, so they're real. What do we get? Uh, we will get, there is, let me just plot it over here in the complex plane, right? So here's the real and imaginary parts. We're going to have a purely real pair, lambda and negative lambda, and then a purely imaginary pair that I'll call I nu and then its complex conjugate negative I nu. So here are the eigenvalues. Let's list them out like this, because we'll, below we'll write the uh, corresponding eigenvectors. And these, you know, these eigenvalues depend on A and B, of course. Um, I nu negative I nu. Um, so here's the eigenvalues and below I'll write the corresponding generalized eigenvectors. So here's E1, E2, E3, E4. And these are, they're column vectors, four dimensional column vectors. And we think we know what to do here. Uh, we would take, We'd construct P, um, a P matrix, which is going to be a linear transformation of E1 written as a column vector, and E2 written as a column vector, E3, E4. Um, and then we would create some new coordinates, I'll call them chi, eta, uh, zeta one, and zeta two. Oh, I don't know how to make zetas. Nobody knows how to make zetas. Zeta two, here we go. 
So if I define these variables in terms of my x, y, dx, dy, then in the new variables, um, the matrix will be P inverse A P, which is just a lambda matrix. This is just going to be um, the Jordan canonical form for the system. So we'll have, uh, it'll be a block diagonal form. So that's the, the real parts. And then because of the complex conjugate parts, we get this final block down here and everything else is zeros. So, chi dot, eta dot, and then zeta one dot, zeta two dot equals lambda, chi, eta, zeta one, zeta two, Uh, professor? Yeah. How come uh, uppercase lambda doesn't have all of the eigenvalues on its main diagonal? Because there's a complex conjugate pair. Oh, okay. So, so that, that, that gets treated as a, a two by two block. If you remember okay. when we had dealt with the case of A plus uh, or minus IB. So now we, we put it in that, that form. Okay, okay. All right. Yeah, so technically the eigenvalue for I nu would be E3 plus I E4, and we're just sort of grouping them that way, if you want. Right, right. Right. So I guess this would be E3 minus I E4. But yeah. Um, and repeated eigenvalues also lead to trouble, which I'm not even going to mention. Um, at least not yet. I don't think it, I, don't, I, I need to. All right, so we've got this, th and this just reduces nicely to uh, chi dot equals lambda chi. So you go, oh, this is the, this is the unstable direction. Um, eta dot equals negative lambda eta. Okay, this is the stable direction. Great. And then we've got uh, these two coupled ones that are in the center direction. But, uh, zeta one dot equals nu zeta two. Zeta two dot equals negative nu zeta one. So these are the these are the center directions. So this follows the pattern, right? Uh, U equals one, and then S must also equal one. And here C is even, C is two. Okay. Um, and that's just that's just the, the linear part. There'd be some kind of transformed nonlinear part if you were to do, if you wanted to look at calculations of the center manifold um, to higher order. Because it is a Hamiltonian system though, the, in the center directions, the, uh, the equilibrium point isn't going to change its character. So the center direction vector field will look topologically like it does even in the linear approximation, uh, which, um, I'm not sure from how I've drawn it here, but I think you know, things will be circulating around the origin and not spiraling in, even if you include higher or order terms. So here's chi one, or sorry, zeta one, zeta two. This is sort of the center subspace. But even if you include nonlinear terms, you're still going to get um, this this type of motion of closed curves in the center subspace. What's another note? Another note is that this matrix P, if you've taken, if you took my course on um, um, Hamiltonian systems, we emphasized a lot that 
if you do transformations of a Hamiltonian system, you typically want to preserve Hamiltonian structure. And this matrix P does not. So P does not lead to a canonical transformation. Um, if you were to, what is a, a, a canonical linear transformation uh, would satisfies, I think, is this it? P transpose J P, is that right? Equals J, I think that's it. And the matrix P is given here doesn't, doesn't do that. Um, what you would have to do is rearrange the columns of P and also rescale them appropriately to achieve this. And um, yeah, that wasn't uh, obvious to me when I first did this, it doesn't get mentioned much. So you need to rearrange the columns of P and rescale them. And you would still end up with a the, the linear dynamics looking like that, but if you wanted to be careful and have a canonical transformation, then that's what you would have to do. And why would you want to do that? Well, because maybe you want to write the quadratic Hamiltonian in the new variables. Let's call that H2 bar. And so if we called uh, this new variable Z bar, then if you want to get the quadratic Hamiltonian, and there may be reasons to do this related to Hamiltonian normal form computations. Um, I forget how I wrote it up above, J transpose. J transpose, and then I'll call it uh, uh, lambda, capital lambda bar, because it might be, there may be a reordering of the columns of lambda as well, if you reorder the columns of P, uh, Z bar. where P is a canonical transformation and um, lambda bar is P inverse A P. That's just a note. Um, if you wanted to get the center manifold of the origin, in this case, it's a 2D center manifold, that you could do 2D calculations. What you'll find is that on uh, each, um, there's another variable, which is the Hamiltonian energy, written in terms of the new variables. And for each constant value of that, let's say this kind of is a, uh, a surface intersecting here, it will intersect exactly in one of these periodic orbits. And so there's, for a higher value of H2, it'll be a different periodic orbit. And in fact, the center manifold is made up completely of just a bunch of periodic orbits. So it looks like, you know, it's roughly parabolic in the whole phase space where each, I guess this is behind, each level is a, um, what do I mean by level? Uh, constant energy is a another periodic orbit. So it's a continuous set of periodic orbits. And as I've drawn them here, they do increase in size. They're all unstable because for each of these periodic orbits, there's a stable and unstable direction in the energy surface. So you don't determine, you don't find out stability, but you can sort of get at these, and there may be bifurcations, right? As you go to large enough things, maybe something happens. Um, 
actually that in the two degree of freedom case, I'm not sure what happens. In the three degree of freedom case, the equilibrium points are uh, um, have a one dimensional stable, one dimensional unstable, but then a four dimensional center manifold. And that opens up just dimensionally more possibilities for what happens on the center manifold. You can have, you don't just have single periodic orbits, you have uh, uh, other things. Um, quasi-periodic tori, and you can get bifurcations, and so on. Um, professor? Yeah. So are center manifolds, is the presence of center manifolds related to integrability? The presence of center manifolds related to integrability. Uh, I don't, I don't know the full answer for that. Um, I mean, you can, you can have center manifolds for systems that are not completely integrable. Mm -hmm. And you can have mm -hmm. chaos on center manifolds. And when you don't have center manifolds, do you not? If you don't have center manifolds, uh, mm -hmm. so you just have stable and unstable. Then is it integrable? I think there are cases where it is in integrable and you, you've got, um, like think of the duffing system one degree of freedom duffing system mm -hmm. that's integrable and the origin at least for the double well duffing has stable and unstable manifolds yeah so yeah i, I don't know if there's a an answer definitive answer okay all right um anything else about that I'm not going to say more about it unless we talk about uh, when we talk about normal forms, we might talk about Hamiltonian normal form theory, but I don't know. So if not, I was going to say something about a topic that I, I, I don't know much about, but it's, it's interesting because it's related to PDEs and in you know, mechanics, we have a lot of PDEs, uh, but there's, there's been some work over the years of, uh, I mean, there's been lots of extensions of center manifold theory. There's been, and Wiggins has these in uh, his book as remarks, usually near the end of a chapter or end of a section. There's been center manifold theory for stochastic systems, um, center manifold theory for infinite dimensional systems. So that's where we get to PDEs. And I'm no expert, not in the slightest. Um, I mean, I'll just give it as an example of what's a PDE. The 1D Navier-Stokes. I don't know if anybody even cares about the 1D Navier-Stokes equation, right? The Navier-Stokes in 3D, it describes how fluids evolve. So if we've got, if U describes the fluid flow in our one dimensional world, um, here it is. X is our one spatial dimension. If we look at the time fixed, then um, here's, here's U, this is U, X, and T, but really we're just seeing it vary with X. So the Navier-Stokes equation, you've got the, the time dependent part and then uh, u times partial u partial x, and then the part due to dissipation. And yeah, this describes how the fluids evolve, not particles in fluids, describes how the fluids evolve. Um, there's more interest in the 3D Navier-Stokes equation that's more complicated. Uh, but, and there are others. Why would you care about center manifolds for PDEs? Well, let's say, suppose that U equals zero. So quiescence, nothing happening, uh, is a equilibrium point of your system.
then you can compute its, you can compute, uh, you know, in principle, the stable, unstable, and center manifolds for that equilibrium point. And what if you have a case like we've talked about before, where there are, there's stable directions, So let's suppose there are stable directions and a finite number of center directions. Then, you know, here's the picture I have in, in mind. You've got this infinite dimensional phase space. And there is, here's the center manifold. Um, the stable directions all uh, decrease exponentially, right? So if you start with some initial condition for your system, and then it'll quickly, and maybe we use two arrows, quickly go down to the center manifold and then slowly evolve on, on there, um, no matter where you start. So you start somewhere, it'll quickly go away, and then you'll be along the center manifold. And then all you have to care about is the dynamics. You, you just have to look at the dynamics reduced to the center manifold. Which would be a finite dimensional reduced order model for your system, giving the long time behavior. So there is some hope. I don't know if there, I, there may be people holding out hope for the Navier-Stokes equation that they could do this. I don't know. Uh, there are some systems that people have looked at where they can they can do this, and they have done it. Um, and I learned about this from, there's a uh, professor in the math department at Virginia Tech, uh, Hong Hu Liu. Um, when he gave his, his interview talk, uh, that's when I learned about some of this stuff, and I, I didn't know about it before. So he's, he's at VT. I don't know if he teaches a course on center manifold reduction for PDEs, but that would be interesting, I think. So here's an example that was given, and there's some details that I'll throw away and not care about, but um, here's what we got. And I'll provide the paper that, uh, that he, he mentions. So this is related to its flame front propagation. Uh, it's a Burgers type equation. Burgers uh, is the, the Burgers equation comes from uh, transport. So this Burgers type equation, partial U, partial T, just like Navier-Stokes. We also have this term, second order derivative term, which Again, it looks like Navier Stokes um, plus lambda u minus lambda and then u partial u, u partial x. Again, something that looks like Navier Stokes. Now, this part doesn't look like Navier Stokes, but um, so that's interesting. And what we're looking at is a domain, the domain uh, x from zero to one. So things are normalized and um, the, it's, I think it's flame front propagation like in a pipe or in some kind of channel. So you've got, um, here's the flame front. And it goes to zero at the ends. Um, so X, this, this is for, um, you got some boundary conditions, which are that U at the ends is zero, and you have some initial condition as well. But um, how would you study this system? Well, one naive thing that even I've learned in uh, uh, PDE courses, is that you can assume a like an infinite series of um, 
uh, time varying modes. So you would write this as a sum, say from one to infinity of, we've got these time varying coefficients A and then fixed spatial modes UI. Okay, I think this is commonly done. What's it called? Separation of variables. And then you would plug it into the ODE, plug it into the PDE and solve. Um, so in this case, there is a one, there's one mode. One of these modes is a, a center manifold. Um, so let's say we used a, a Fourier series approximation. So we do u i x is you know, square root of two, um, and I'll I'll actually write it. In, I don't like that. I'm going to write n. In fact, maybe I'll write all of these as n, so it doesn't bother me so much. So u n is uh, square root of two sine n pi x or n is an integer. Now we've, um, the space of the, the UNs is uh, a Hilbert space, which means it's equipped with an inner product. And that inner product, um, let's say we've got U and V. This is how I'll write an inner product. You take the integral of u and v um, over the domain from zero to one. Okay. Now, what's special about these, uh, the uns, is they are they form an orthonormal basis for the space of the the solution. So the uns form a orthonormal basis. What does that mean? Well, um, hopefully you know your properties of uh, taking integrals of sine functions. So u i u j, right, this is going to be u i x of t, U N, well, th these are just X's, aren't they? Uh, U I X U J X D X. Well, given how we've defined them, this is going to equal the Kronecker delta. So it equals one if I equals J and zero if I does not equal J, which means these functions, the un x functions are an orthonormal basis. So then if you plug this series solution into here, you can get, uh, you'll get ODEs for the time varying coefficients a and the part that's that I don't know much about, but it's in this paper sign Wong 2006 that I'll provide. They claim that there is a, there's just a one mode is a center mode and the rest are stable. Meaning they, they exponentially decrease important in, in importance and everything just sort of collapses to this one dimensional center mode. And so what is that center mode? Um, so here they write it this way, the center mode, it's A1 T and then uh, U1. So that means there's this time varying coefficient and then square root two sine pi x. So everything's going to go on to, um, if I do, here's 
if a1 was greater than zero, you'd get something that looks like that between zero, x equals zero, and x equals one. One hump of the sine function. And maybe that, you know, that a could vary with time. <clears throat> if we now, if we plug this into the PDE, um, actually, we, we plug the entire series into the PDE. Then what would we get? Um, we plug this in, into here and I'll do it for you. Uh, yeah. At least for the first two. So a1 dot u1 x plus a2 dot u2 x and so on equals, and this is what you get. You'll get lambda minus pi squared um, a1 u1 x plus lambda minus four pi squared a2. This, the pi and the four pi, that comes from that second derivative term. A2 u2 x. Um, thing that throws everything off, um, ruins the party, is this, we get minus lambda, and then it is a1 t u1 x plus a2 t u2 x, so on, times, and then the derivative, which is going to be a1 t pi square root of two cosine pi x plus a2 t two pi square root of t cosine two pi x, etc. And now what do we do? Well, uh, we take the projection of this equation onto the different basis functions. So that means to take the inner product of this equation uh, with u1x, then u2x, et cetera. And let's just see what happens when we do that. If you do that and um, like for, we take the take the inner product of this first term, right? Which you'll have is a one dot u one x with u one x. Well, that'll because it's an orthonormal basis. This will be one. This will go to u uh, two with u one be zero, and then, and so on. And you'll get some. You'll pick up some things. Um, let me just cut to the chase and show you what the ODEs are. You get a1 dot equals lambda minus pi squared a1. Okay, it looks linear, but then the first nonlinear term shows up here. a1, a2 plus higher order terms that we could compute if we wanted. a2 dot equals lambda minus four pi squared a2. Um, you get a minus sign from just how things work out. Uh, what is it here? <laughs> lambda pi square root two a1 squared, is that right? Yep, plus higher order terms. 
But then here's the thing. A2 dot equals zero at uh, steady state. Because uh, the number two mode, as well as all the other modes greater than one, are stable modes. So they are shrinking exponentially. So this will go to zero, in which case you'll be left with uh, A2. So there'll be a relationship between A2 and A1. And this goes to uh, A1 squared lambda pi square root of two over lambda minus four pi squared. Okay, now plug that into the A1 equation. You get, and I'm gonna write it in a suggestive way, lambda minus lambda critical A1 plus um, some stuff, I'll call that beta a1 cubed plus higher order terms. And from this, we can plot a bifurcation diagram. So that's what's kind of cool. Um, what's our parameter? A parameter is lambda, and then this is uh, A1. And what we have is a there's a stable point until we get to lambda critical so for lambda less than lambda critical um, the no dynamic state right a1 equaling zero means nothing is happening so the, the quiescent state is the only uh, asymptotically stable one but after that quiescent state becomes unstable and you get just like before, a pitchfork bifurcation. Maybe we can call this the uh, U plus solution, and this is the U minus solution. So these become stable. We just throw in the arrows like we're used to throwing in. That's what we get. So all transients for lambda, for lambda greater than lambda critical, all transients. As, the, as all transients die out, you end up on just the flame is you know pointing upwards or the flame is pointing downwards. I think that's what that means. Yeah. And you could read more about that. I think there's some interesting promise to this approach. I don't think all systems are going to have like a one dimensional center manifold. There's been some work. Um, by people looking at say Raleigh Bernard convection, where there's hints that it's pretty large dimensional, but uh, not terribly big, like less than a hundred. So if you've got some system where the center manifold is less than a hundred dimension, um, there, there's some hope. I mean, maybe you'd want to start with something smaller, like three or four dimensions, but there's some interesting promise, I think, to this uh, center manifolds for PDEs. Any questions about it? No. Let me see. Um, all right. So we've got 10 minutes left. Um, I'm wondering if I should just leave center manifold theory for maps for next time uh, so that we could just do it all at, at one go. Um, I think so. I think so. So I'm just going to mention that there's been, there's center manifolds. Um, it's been developed for uh, stochastic systems as well. And there's been other, there's been other developments. Um, 
what I focused on here, because it's what Wiggins primarily does, is the Taylor series approximation to the center manifold. There are other ways to uh, to calculate the center manifold. It's just the Taylor series is the most direct, and it seems to like give you the it gives an answer, even if it's approximate, not good. But there there are other methods, and I I think Wiggins mentions them. If not, um, I'll try to provide. Uh, some material that does. So I'd say there are other computational methods. Besides the Taylor series approximation. And the, the, the names associated with that don't don't come to mind right now. I just know that there are there are other other methods. 